So, a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Mia Huna Vrancian. I'm the new chair of EVA's Division for Economics. And it's a very great pleasure to welcome you all to this seminar today on the Japanese economy, challenges and future perspective. Organized by EVA, the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, the Sweden-Japan Foundation, and the Embassy of Japan. And of course, it's a very great honor to welcome Mr. Hiroshi Nakaso, Nakaso, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Japan. You have had a full day in Stockholm, where you have visited the Riksbank, the Ministry of Finance, the Swedish National Debt Office, Riksgälden in Swedish, the Swedish Financial Supervisory Authority, Finansinspektionen, and we are very happy to have you receive you here tonight at EVA. Mr. Nakaso, during your career as a central banker, you have firmly stressed the importance of ensuring financial stability. In dealing with the financial crisis during the 1990s, in fighting Japan's nearly two decade long deflation that has followed, including the Bank of Japan's pursuit of its recently introduced quantitative and quality monetary easing with a negative interest rate. The theme of your spe speech is challenges towards financial stability and the policy frontier, unconventional monetary policy, macro prudence, and financial institutions' low profitability. We look forward to learn about your views on why financial stability is important, how it can be achieved, and how monetary policy and macroprudential policy fall in the context of financial stability. The interest in the development and experiences of Japan is great in Sweden. Just a few weeks ago, you met with the members of the EVA Royal Technology Mission to Japan, chaired by the His Majesty the King of Sweden, I believe there are several participants in the mission that are here tonight in the audience. So let me also extend a very warm welcome to Governor Stefan Ingves from the Riksbank, who will provide a comment after your speech. My guess is we will learn more about the Japanese experience for the Swedish case. So a very warm welcome to you both. This seminar will be led by Klaus Eklund, known to us all, a well-known economist, and a member of the EVA Division on Economics, for Economics. And um, you will guide us through this evening. But first of all, I will now give the floor to Edvard Fleetwood, Secretary General of the Sweden Japan Foundation, please. Uh, tonight's event would not have taken place if it had not been for the late Mr. Robert Stenran. He was a friend of the keynote speaker tonight, Mr. Nakaso, but he was also a long-standing observer of the Japanese economy and the financial markets. Much to our regret, he, after a short per period of illness, passed away on May 20th, 2015. He was well known in the banking sector, having worked for Handelsbanken, Essebanken and Swedbank, 
He was stationed in New York, London, and Tokyo, where he, in Tokyo, he chaired the, uh, the Swedbank office for over seven years. At that time, he was also the chairman of the SNS and the local cham Swedish Chamber of Commerce. Later, he became the chairman of Community Invest and a member of the board of one of the AP pension fund, the seventh. <clears throat> he was active in the media, giving uh, interviews to financial uh, press, including Financial Times a few times, and at that time he also made comments about the Japanese economy. He was one of the few persons who, at an early stage in the 1990s, uh, predicted that uh, the Japanese economy would have a very slow recovery, uh, often in opposition to many other persons who had the interest of promoting Japan and uh, promising green fields ahead. As vice chairman of the Sweden-Japan Foundation, one of the co-organizers tonight, Robert took several initiatives to promote the relations between Sweden and Japan. For example, by engaging the swear of Swedbank and the savings banks in uh, <coughs> sponsoring scholarships to students uh, to study in Japan. Already two years ago, Robert suggested that we should invite uh, Vice Governor uh, Nakasu uh, but uh, to give a lecture here. And after he passed away, this initiative was taken over by the IVA, JSPS, and the Japanese Embassy and my organization. As a very pers busy person, Mr. Nakaso first hesitated to accept, but when he learned about the decease of Robert Stenram, he responded, Robert was my best friend for 20 years. I would be honored to commemorate him with a speech in Stockholm. And he made his calendar for March available to us to select the date. We were all very moved by Mr. Nakasa's devotion to an old friend. So before we proceed, I would suggest that we devote a moment of silence to commemorate Robert Stimlow. So, after remembering Robert, we now move over to the main proceedings of tonight. And um, we live in interesting times, as you know. Deflationary threats all over, slow growth, experimental economic policy making, globally, or at least in very many countries. And in this context, of course, Japan is of special interest because of its long history of demographic headwinds and, like I said, experimental policy making. So, to shed light over the situation and maybe learn lesson from Japan, we have, as you have heard, an honored guest, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Japan, Mr. Hirosh Nakaso. Uh, and the comments will come from Stefan Ingves. Now, uh, Governor Nakaso has been with the BOJ for many years, since 1978, according to the BOJ homepage. And he has, of course, held several important positions in the bank. Uh, but he has also stayed some years with the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, sort of the central bank of the central banks. Uh, and he's held his present position since 2013. In this position, he's one of two deputy governors and in charge of, brace yourself, and I quote the website of the BOJ, in charge of the Monetary Affairs Department, Financial Markets Department, Research and Statistics Department, International Department, Secretariat of the Policy Board, Financial System and Bank Examination Department, Payment and Settlement Systems Department, Operations Department, Information Systems Services Department, Personnel and Corporate Affairs Department, and Administration Department. Phew. So, um, if we are to listen to someone who can give us a picture a comprehensive picture of where Japan is going and why, and lessons learned. I don't think we can find anyone better or more qualified than the Deputy Governor Nakaso. The floor is yours. 
Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor um, and pleasure for me to take, be able to speak to you at this uh, esteemed uh, institution today. I am also honored to be with Stefan Engvis, the very respected and experienced governor in the central banking community. Uh, before I get uh, into the substance of this speech, uh, let me first uh, thank the person uh, who made this uh, uh, event possible, uh, Mr. Robert Sternrum. Uh, Mr. Sternrum was the Tokyo uh, representative of Swedbank in the 1990s uh, during the acute financial crisis in Japan. While he was posted in Tokyo, uh, he was instrumental in liaising very closely with the Japanese banking industry, and I benefited from his deep insights and thoughtful advice based on his experiences as a professional banker. It was indeed uh, the most turbulent of times, but we also became friends, and I have long enjoyed his friendship since then. I deeply regret that he no longer is with us, and wish to pay my tribute to the great work he has accomplished in linking Sweden and Japan in the world of finance. Robert, I will not forget how much we owe to you. May his soul, now joined by his beloved wife, Siv, rest in peace. Over the years, uh, both Sweden and Japan have confronted a few very difficult issues uh, in terms of monetary policy and financial stability. In the late 1980s, we saw financial bubbles develop and burst. And from 2008 to 9, we tackled the most recent global financial crisis together. And today, the two countries are fighting deflationary headwinds. As you know, the Riksbank and Bank Japan have adopted uh, negative interest rate policies so as to achieve their respective price stability uh, targets. In order to uh, discharge our responsibilities for maintaining uh, price and financial stability, uh, central banks must be prepared to meet uh, new challenges as they appear. Now, reflecting on my experiences, I have been on the front lines as a central banker during Japan's financial crisis in the 1990s and 2000s, and during our bank's uh, long battle with deflation for nearly two decades. Not once during all those years could I forget the importance of uh, financial stability. With this background, I will describe today the importance of financial stability and the policy implications of newly emerging challenges uh, from three perspectives. Unconventional monetary policy, macro prudence, and low profitability of financial institutions. Uh, to begin with, uh, let me go back to the 1990s and explain my experiences during the bursting of the bubble economy in Japan. As I touched on at the beginning, uh, both Sweden and Japan experienced financial bubbles. Nevertheless, the subsequent paths of the two countries were quite different. In Sweden, uh, whose moves in the real GDP and real estate prices are shown on the left panel of this chart one, after the crisis in the early 1990s, capital was quickly injected into the banking system and the stability of the financial system was restored. In addition, the Swedish krona was floated and the Riksbank Bank was able to ease monetary policy. With the tailwind of depreciating krona contributing, uh, the Swedish economy began to recover as early as 1993. Furthermore, uh, following Sweden's accession to uh, the European Union in 1995, factors such as uh, the growth of the IT industry benefiting from the increases in inbound investment contributed to the productivity growth. In fact, Sweden's potential growth actually increased after the bursting of the bubble. In contrast, Japan, uh, whose uh, performance is shown on the right panel, only managed to inject capital into financial institutions on a meaningful scale after the dark November of 1997, when it experienced a series of failures of large financial institutions. That was nearly eight years after the bubble burst. During those years, financial institutions' behavior, such as evergreening their loans to practically failed businesses by extending additional loans, resulted in a further buildup of impaired assets. This made it all the more difficult to 
uh, cleanse financial institutions' balance sheets of problem loans and which distorted the allocation of resources. The layering of these multiple factors pushed the Japanese economy into deflation and concurrently productivity growth declined. Uh, furthermore, uh, this period overlapped with the rapid changes in demography resulting from a declining work age population against the backdrop of a low birth rate and aging. The confluence of uh, uh, the two current uh, financial sector problems and demographic changes significantly, significantly pulled down Japan's potential growth, which is shown in a red solid, solid line on this chart, together with the contributing factors in bars. Now, that in turn exacerbated the over-leveraging of the corporate sector and discouraged corporate investment uh, from a macro perspective, macroeconomic perspective, lower investment depressed uh, productivity growth, which again negatively impacted potential growth. So there was a kind of uh, vicious cycle. Over leveraging in the corporate sector led to the decline in potential growth rate, which in turn exacerbated the difficulty of resolving non performing loans in the banking sector and over leveraging in the corporate sector. Um, admitting one can be wise only after the event, in retrospect, the forbearance policy at an early stage after the bursting of the asset bubble and the underestimation of the systemic nature of what was going on in the financial sector allowed the problem in the banking sector to develop into a full-blown financial crisis. This is the shorthand account of the extended stagnation and deflation following the bursting of the bubble, the so-called the lost two decades in Japan. Um, from this painful episode, we have learned two things. One is that financial stability is the foundation of sustained growth of the economy. And another is that changes in potential growth amplify the financial cycle and consequently impact financial stability. The widespread recognition in the international policy fora of the need to to take account of the macroprudential perspective may be a consequence of the recent global financial crisis. But Japan's predicament that preceded it seems to amply, uh, amply uh, underscore the importance of such a perspective. So to me, this was a formative experience as a central banker, and I have attached importance to macroprudence ever since. Next on my agenda today is the implementation of monetary policy by the Bank of Japan and its relationship to the macroprudential policy. After the bursting of the bubble, the lowering of potential growth brought about a large decline in natural rate of interest, uh, which is the guidepost for monetary policy formulation. On, on chart three, uh, you see in red solid line Japan's estimated natural rate of interest with an error band, uh, potential growth rate in um, green dotted line, and real interest rate in blue dotted line. As you know, uh, monetary easing is used to bring down real interest rates below the natural rate of interest. Mindful of the prevailing views that uh, then, then that there was a zero lower bound for nominal interest rates, um, the quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, the so-called QQE, introduced by the Bank of Japan in April 2013, was a breakthrough in the following sense. Um, the bank made a strong commitment to achieve the price stability target of 2% at the earliest possible time, which encouraged inflation expectation to, to rise. Concurrently, the bank, recognizing that there was only limited room for short-term interest rate to decline, exerted downward pressure on nominal interest rates across the entire yield curve by purchasing a large amount of long-term Japanese government bonds, the JGBs, so that together with higher inflation expectations, real interest rate uh, could be brought down. The QQE with a negative interest rate framework that was introduced by the Bank of Japan this January aims at reinforcing the existing QQE and supports the activities of firms and households, 
thereby ensuring the earliest attainment of the 2% inflation target. The policy is intended to work through the same channels by bringing down uh, real interest rates. As I just noted, the conventional wisdom was that there was a zero lower bound for nominal interest rates. But the demonstration by, the, uh, by a few European central banks, including the Riks Bank, that such limitation could be overcome to some degree, led the Bank of Japan to adopt the new policy framework. In fact, after the introduction of the negative policy rate, the financial environment has further relaxed, with the yield curve shifting significantly lower and financial institutions lowering their lending rates. Uh, in this chart four, you see a sequential shifting down of the yield curve. On the blue line, which is the most recent uh, yield curve, maturities up to 10 years are now in the negative territory. Um, against this backdrop of uh, these uh, positive developments in financial intermediation, uh, from the macroprudential perspective, uh, their effects of financial on financial stability must be carefully monitored. I believe that we need to be mindful of two angles. One is the overheating risk, where the extremely relaxed financial environment could destabilize the financial uh, system through excessive risk taking. The other uh, is the uh, contraction risk, uh, where low revenue streams resulting from low interest rate uh, could erode the risk appetite and or undermine uh, the soundness of financial institutions. Now, for the time being, uh, we believe that there is generally no need to be overly concerned as regards the overheating risk. There is evidence of increasing real estate transactions with prices of apartment in Tokyo area uh, topping their previous peak during the bubble years, but, but leverage in the real estate sector is still not excessive. Our general view is that the financial sector has a robust capital base relative to risks uh, taken, and its resilience in the face of stress is sufficient, and thus it could undertake positive risk-taking and portfolio rebalancing under QQE with a negative interest rate framework. At the same time, we believe that the contraction risk at present is also small. Um, the extended period of monetary easing has tended to pressure the interest rate margin of Japanese financial institutions, negatively impacting their revenue uh, streams, as you can see on this uh, chart. While this is not something that is unique to a setting of unconventional monetary policy, but in an economic environment where such exceptional policy needs to be adopted, there tends to be less room for deposit rates to fall. In other words, the interest rate margins are tighter than ever. And additional easing of policy could result in a non-linear compression of margins. Having said that, however, uh, Japanese financial institutions have been able to remain sound because the reduction in margins thus far has been more than offset, more than offset by revenue improvements against the backdrop of improving economic conditions under monetary easing, such as increases in lending volume, lower credit costs, and higher investment returns in, in securities. The policy framework of QQE with a negative interest rate maintains monetary easing in terms of quantity, quality, and boosts it strongly with a negative policy rate. As such, it will strongly influence the financial system. Accordingly, the Bank of Japan must thoroughly monitor and analyze the stable st state of the financial system from a macroprudential uh, perspective. To this end, uh, the Bank of Japan is publishing its financial system report twice a year. In this report, it assesses the stability of Japan's financial system from various angles, including the balance between the amount of risks borne by the financial institutions and their financial basis, macro stress testing, and macro risk indicators. I believe that independent examination of developments from financial perspective will enhance the credibility of the monetary policy. Now, even if the risks are contained at this juncture, 
what should we do if, in the future, the overheating risk becomes more apparent? I think there are two contrasting views on the relationship between monetary and macro prudential policies. The separation principle and leaning against the wind. The separation principle says to render unto monetary policy things that concern price stability and render unto macro prudential policy things that concern financial stability. On the other hand, the latter, the leaning against the wind, holds that if the amplification of financial imbalances is expected to threaten price stability in the long run, the central bank should resort to monetary policy in order to dampen the financial cycle, notwithstanding uh, a temporary deviation of inflation from the target. Let me offer you my views, uh, which, which are influenced by the experiences of the Japanese bubble again. Um, up until the 1980s, the Bank of Japan was requiring banks to comply with a guidance that set their loan growth at levels individually assigned by the bank. Uh, this arrangement, called the window guidance, was then regarded as a tool for monetary policy, but under the current taxonomy, it would be regarded as, as a, as a time-varying macroprudential policy akin to regulation to loan-to-value or debt-to-income to regulation. There are two schools of thought regarding the effectiveness of this tool. Independent tool theory which held that window guidance was effective by itself. Meanwhile, the complementary tool theory held that window guidance had to be used alongside the mainstream monetary policy of official discount rate adjustment. The subject was um, actively discussed among the academia, and those supporting the independent tool theory argued that a tightening win of window guidance could dampen the financial cycle even if the official discount rate was held steady, remained unchanged. Now, the Bank of Japan, in the meantime, uh, uh, basically adopted the complementary tool theory and explained window guidance as a tool to support general policy instruments, uh, such as changes to the official discount rate, rather than an independent uh, policy instrument. Um, Notwithstanding such an official position, in the last half of the 1980s, as a call for international policy coordination necessitated the maintenance of a low interest rate environment with a view to expanding domestic demand, the Bank of Japan attempted to respond to signs of financial excesses, excesses through the tightening of window guidance. As a result, the growth of bank lending slowed gradually in the late 1980s as you can see on the left panel of the chart six, this chart. But the large corporates were still able to raise funds in this corresponding period from outside the banking sector through the issuance of bonds, as you see on the right panel. This period coincided with the gradual relaxation of underwriting guidelines for corporate bonds and the buoyant stock market, which was partly a reflection of monetary easing, that reduced the cost of equity finding, uh, financing, such as convertible bonds. The resulting increases in capital market financing sustained the relaxed financial environment, and corporate sector balance sheets kept on expanding. Thus, the Bank of Japan could not effectively deal with the signs of overheating. Another notable feature of the Japanese bubble uh, uh, in the late 1980s was that potential growth and the natural rate of interest were both fairly high at the time, as we have seen on chart two and three. The degree of monetary easing at one particular level of policy rate depends on whether the natural rate of interest is high or low. When the natural rate of interest and expected growth were high, there are likely to be strong incentives for both financial institutions and corporates to circumvent the restriction imposed by the window guidance. So, um, in light of the Japanese experiences, while I, I fully subscribe to the view that narrowly confined financial imbalances should be countered by macro prudential policy as the first line of defense, the effectiveness of such policy by itself is 
very uncertain. Considering the changes in financial market structure due to deregulation and the level of the nat natural uh, rate of interest. Accordingly, I cannot fully uphold the separation principle, which uh, reflects uh, the view that time varying macro prudential policy measures are by themselves effective. I believe we should leave open the possibility of responding to widening financial imbalances with fiscal policy, maybe including uh, uh, tax policy and monetary policy. Such thinking is reflected in, in how Bank of Japan conducts monetary policy, where the Bank of Japan examines economic and monetary conditions in a so-called two-pillar approach. The deliberation of the most likely outcomes for the first pillar and the deliberation of other risk factors relevant for the conduct of monetary, of monetary policy, financial imbalances in particular for the second pillar. Let me now turn to uh, the other risk, the contraction risk. So what should we do if, the risk, if this risk becomes obvious? Or more specifically, what should we make of the low profitability of financial institutions from a macroprudential perspective? I think this question seems to be attracting more and more attention in Europe as well. In order to properly think about this issue, it is important to distinguish between low profitability due to acute problems and that due to chronic issues. When profits of financial institutions are severely declined because of acute stresses, it is necessary to have a sufficient capital in order to maintain financial stability. Uh, looking at current developments, the international banking system has significantly raised the capital ratio, reflecting a uh, strengthening of the capital rules following the recent financial crisis. This would not have been possible were it not for the leadership demonstrated by Stefan Engvis as the chair of the Basel uh, Committee on Banking Supervision. Such capital strength is also important for the effectiveness of uh, transmission of uh, monetary policy. Given that monetary easing pressures interest, rate, uh, interest, rate, uh, interest margins at financial institutions in the short run, weakly capitalized institutions will not be able to increase lending. This could uh, undercut the positive effects of easing. However, as I noted earlier, the fact that Japanese financial institutions were able to increase lending, the Bank of Japan implemented unconventional monetary policies and margins were compressed, uh, demonstrates how well capitalized the Japanese institutions are. So in short, even if the, the economy suffers an acute stress and profits of financial institutions are negatively impacted, as the cushion provided by sufficient capital prevents the instability of the financial system, stimulus from monetary policy easing should provide a shot in the arm that would uh, turn around the economy and thus the profits of financial institutions. Such an outcome, however, is not assured when the financial system is confronted with chronic stresses, even if the current levels of capitals are adequate. This is because the persistence of the environment in which financial institutions cannot get sufficient net returns on capital would eventually erode the capital of financial institutions. One example of such chronic stress is foot dragging by financial institutions in their recognition of non-performing loans and its flip side, the over-leveraging of corporates. Another is the inflection of potential growth rate, which would lower firms' expectation for growth and depress investment. In fact, in many developed economies, excess savings are observed in corporate sector, as shown on, on, on in, in chart 7. Uh, with the stagnation of investment comes a decline in productivity growth, which would again negatively impact the potential growth rate. As the process unfolds, financial institutions would face downward pressure on their lending rates. Financial institutions facing the, the resulting compression of interest rate margins would then pursue volume to increase their revenue flows. Such increases in competitive pressure would further depress lending rates and revenues as well. 
excessive competition by financial institutions in lending would thus make it easier for low productivity firms to survive, hindering the efficient allocation of resources in the economy and the so called creative distraction, and consequently would prevent the lifting of the potential growth rate. If the low levels of profits at financial institutions and the depressed potential growth rate are tied together by excessive lending competition by financial institutions, the risk that profits become too low to recover could gradually increase unless financial institutions succeed in changing their business models. Joseph Alois Schumpeter, in his seminal The Theory of Economic Development, stresses the important role played by the banker as well as that of the entrepreneur. The banker profits from her ability to identify those entrepreneurs who develop truly innovative undertakings that are high quality startups and from generating information that leads to improved corporate performance. Schumpeter expects that such profit motives of the banker, backed by her exceptional ability to pick up winners, would bring about a more efficient reallocation of risks in the macro economy and lead to an endogenous rise in the economic growth rate. This role of the banker,、uh, promoting the creative distractions through financial intermediation, has not changed since the time of Schumpeter. However, as economies mature, the nature of investment that supports innovation by entrepreneurs changes gradually from investment in tangible assets to those in intangible assets. Such as research and development, information technology, and human and organize, organizational capital. Accordingly, investment in intangible assets is now identified as an important element of new sources of growth in the developed economies. If I may point out findings of one recent research study, investment in intangible assets are more sensitive to the availability of internal funds or cash flow. Compared with investment in tangible assets. If financial markets were perfect markets, the sources of funds, that is, internal financing or external financing, including bank financing, would be completely、uh, substitutable, and corporate investment would not be affected by the availability of internal funds. Nevertheless, the fact that investment in intangible assets are more sensitive to the availability of internal funds. Uh, suggests that firms could be facing financial constraints due to information asymmetries. One could say that such asymmetries result from the difficulty of assessing collateral value of intangible assets compared with tangible assets. Consequently, there are opportunities、uh, for bankers to profit from overcoming these information asymmetries. As shown in this chart, eight, in Japan, the ratio of investment in intangible assets to nominal GDP is lower than that in the United States and other major peers. So, if financial institutions are able to tease out the corporate demand for investment in intangible assets, that not only would enhance the productivity of the whole economy, but also would contribute to solving the structural problem of low profitability of financial institutions. The future path of the Japanese economy would be influenced by the behavior of financial institutions, whether they would continue their war of attrition under the, their existing business models or would expand their business frontiers by unearthing new financing needs. Just as in human beings for、uh, whom chronic syndromes demand fundamental changes in lifestyles. Financial institutions may need to be prepared to fundamentally change their business models in order to extricate themselves from a structural lack of profitability. The Bank of Japan has, been, has implemented a few measures that would encourage financial institutions to implement their essential reforms. One is to adjust the way in which the bank injects liquidity into the financial system. For example,、um, The fund provisioning measure to support strengthening of the foundation for economic growth and purchases of ETFs composed of stocks issued by firms that are proactively investing in physical and human capital. 
I think these measures are expected to play catalytic roles in enhancing the financial intermediary functions of financial institutions and capital markets, which would foster uh, productivity increases and ultimately lead to improvements in the potential rate of growth. Another set of measures is designed to enhance the function of financial institutions to efficiently allocate resources. The Bank of Japan is actively providing financial institutions with information and know-how through、uh, seminars and workshops so that they can enhance the value of their financial intermediation through, for example, support for startup businesses, business matching, rejuvenating businesses, and utilizing information technology. These undertakings by the Bank of Japan are somewhat different from those found in the conventional macro prudential toolkit, but I do believe that they perform important functions in promoting financial stability.、Um, before concluding my remarks today, I would like to emphasize that if changes in potential growth rate would influence the effectiveness of monetary and macro prudential policies, And ultimately affect price and financial stability, that would naturally affect central banks' thinking on policy formulation. As a matter of fact, in the area of monetary policy, the effectiveness of policy had been constrained in Japan by the concurrent decline in expected inflation and the persistent deflation and in the potential growth rate. In this regard, the current pursuit by the Bank of Japan. Of the 2% inflation target through QQE with negative interest rate will contribute to lifting potential growth through purging of the deflationary mindset and encouraging capital formation. At the same time, in the area of macro prudential policy, the current focus on strengthening regulation does not solve the structural problem of low profitability at financial institutions. So, with regard to this problem in the global policy forum, The jury is still out, so to speak, as regards how to expand the policy frontier. Perhaps central banks need to be a little more flexible in the designing of macro prudential policies to serve this end. Of course, of course structural problems cannot solve be, solve be, be solved by central banks' actions. Economic policies of the government and undertakings by firms and financial institutions aimed at encouraging innovation are also essential. The Bank of Japan is working with these actors in order to tackle the new challenges in terms of financial stability. Ladies and gentlemen, these are indeed difficult times. I remember、uh, talking with Robert Stenrum over dinner in a restaurant downtown Tokyo almost two decades ago during the darkest days of the Japanese financial crisis. He then said to me, Let us always have hope, be reasonably optimistic. And think about the best ways we can do for the happiness and welfare of our next generations. I could no more agree, and two decades on, his words still remain my guiding principles today. This concludes my speech. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Governor Caso, for this comprehensive presentation.、Uh, we will come back to that shortly, but first we're going to have a comment from the Swedish Central Bank Governor. All the Swedes know him, of course, Stefan Ingves. For those foreign guests who don't know Stefan Ingves, I should say that he was previously、uh, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Sweden, and for many years he also spent time in Washington at the International Monetary Fund, where he was there. Should I say firefighter that they sent out to troubled corners of the world to solve different financial stability problems? And then, of course, during our financial crisis in Sweden 20 years ago in the early 90s, he was heading the so called emergency ward、uh, in the Swedish policy central s t a t So, to summarize, he is the Slatan of financial stability. <laughs> <laughs> well,、um It's not quite like that. I just happened to come walking down the corridor in the finance ministry when things started falling apart and somebody had to deal with it. <laughs> But Hiroshi, you and I, in some sense, have a bit of a similar background, and、uh, it's wonderful to have you here in Stockholm.
because over the years, beginning sometime in the 90s, we have met everywhere in the world, in various meetings, very often, of course, at the BIS, but also in many, many other places. And uh, it's a great joy and a good thing to see here in Stockholm, because I don't think that this particular venue has, has been one of our meeting places uh, before. And that's, that, that's good in it all, all, all in itself. I also remember Robert Stenram as one of those persons who, on the one hand, was a Swedish banker, while on the other hand, he probably was more likely that you would meet him not in Stockholm, but somewhere else, in Tokyo or London or some other place, where he was actually talking about uh, how to get the money from place A to Stockholm or some other part of, of, of this, this country, because that was the work that that he was doing, and I also remember him well from, from those, uh, uh, th those years. And of course, back then, he knew a lot, about, lot more about banking than I did, because given the age difference, he had seen a lot, and I was still uh, learning. Uh, let me here make a few remarks on, on some of the similar challenges between what we are trying to achieve in this, in this country and some of the challenges of, of, Bank, of uh, Bank of Japan. And, and what we are trying uh, to do and how to, how to get, get there. Because, uh, Hiroshi, many of the themes that you have touched on, they are not really that dissimilar between, between these two countries. I mean, the numbers are, of course, never exactly identical, but, but many of the issues are fairly close in the, in, 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 in the sense that if you look at the numbers, you also realize that there are numerous uh, similarities that we have to deal with in, in one form or the other. And now I'm confined myself to basically the financial sector and, and, and monetary policy, so I'm not at all getting into the whole issue of age distribution and a number of other issues that are also relevant in our, our two types of e economies. But let me start with the first one, and you have touched on this already. If you look at inflation, you can see here that both of us have struggled with, uh, with low inflation for actually quite, uh, quite a while. Uh, in the Japanese case, a bit lower than in our case. Then these cu curves, uh, the graphs almost coincide uh, towards the end of this period, and that's, that's essentially the period I'm, I'm, I'm talking about here, with the difference that you had this thing about the VAT. Uh, that, that produced that very, very marked uh, jump. Uh, but now, in essence, uh, these graphs are fairly, fairly close to each other, and that means that uh, we have a kind of a similar face here when it comes to the history. And that also, of course, means that uh, when it comes to arguing back and forth and thinking about central banking and, and how to do these things in order to make inflation to go up, uh, some of the debates and some of the issues are, are quite almost, uh, almost, um, almost the same. So, in addition to what you talked about from a Japanese perspective, let me show a few gra graphs here uh, showing where we are. We have uh, presently a repo rate at minus 0.5, and following the BOJ's recent decision, uh, we welcome Japan to the negative policy rate club. Uh, if you go... 10 years back in time or 20 years back in time, most people would have said that will never happen. It's highly unlikely and we don't know whether it will work or not. How do you actually do it? Now, coming at it from a little bit different angles when it comes to the technical aspects of doing these things, we came to the same conclusion that it's actually, in some sense, physically doable and, and that it also seems to uh, work. You started doing quantitative easing much sooner than, than we did, uh, but not now we are also belong to the same club when it comes to this, because we're presently and have been for some time now buying government debt at a fairly quick uh, pace. And that means that uh, towards the summer, we have actually bought roughly one third of the outstanding stock of government, uh, government debt. And that's also a quite sizable sum. One difference, of course, though, is that given that we don't have that much debt compared to the Japanese case, you can keep at it longer than, uh, than we can because we eventually, if we keep going for a long, long time, we would run out of debt to buy. Uh, but on the other hand, and I'll get back to that in a while, you have a lot of uh, public sector debt. We have a lot of, nowadays, we have a lot of maybe too much private sector debt. So. One way or the other, we seem to be accumulating debt uh, n n n nowadays, and that's, uh, that's an issue in, it, uh, in itself. 
One debate that all of us have as well is to what extent uh, monetary policy really works in this environment and, and, and what happens when you, when you lower the policy rate and when you move into negative territory. And here, just by looking at these graphs, basically the conclusion is that we have had a relatively normal pass-through of changes in the policy rate to the lending rates to households and and, uh, and, 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 and and companies. So, so far, no major surprises when it comes to what happens in the, in the system. It seems to work. One exception, though, is that when it comes to uh, deposit rates uh, for households, they, they kind of have level, leveled out at, uh, at, at, uh, at, at, at zero. But all in all, doing these things in combination with buying government debt and creating more money in the system all the time, it seems to work in the sense that it brings down the general level of uh, uh, interest rates in the economy. And that also holds, actually, if I, if I were to uh, put up a, a slide here with the, uh, with, the, with the yield curve, because this has also, the way, pretty much the way you showed on your slides, substantially brought down uh, the yield curve, particularly the yield curve for the, uh, for the government. Now, uh, so far, uh, our impression is that, uh, that, if, that this uh, system seems to work in the sense that GDP growth has been uh, uh, on, on a positive trend for, for quite, uh, quite a while, and presently growth is fairly high. It's actually above, above trend. And if you go back to 2014 and from then on, inflation seems to be moving up uh, one way, uh, one way or, or the other. With a lot of a lot of jumping up and down, but the trend is uh, is is pretty uh, pretty clear. So if this thing works out the way we hope it will, that means that uh, we will get to the inflation targeting nirvana sometime in 2017. But then, who knows what happens? Uh, what happens after that? Because be, being in central banker, it's kind of like a—it's a story which never ends. It just goes on and on and on. So you meet your target for a while, but then new things happen, and you have to struggle uh, struggle with that. Now, you also touched on the issue of what happens in this environment when it comes to the banking sector and, 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 uh, and, and what, what happens to the banks and the profitability of the banks. This is what you, with your terminology in your speech, uh, call the uh, contraction, uh, contraction uh, risk. Now here, uh, and I, I don't know if we are kind of an exception when it comes to these things, if you look at... Uh, at the return on equity, the blue graph, uh, and compare Swedish banks' return on equity to what is happening in, uh, uh, for, for other uh, European banks, you can see that there is a substantial difference. And that means that in this low interest rate environment, at least so far, this hasn't really been a major issue when it comes to Swedish, uh, uh, Swedish banking. And also, if you look at the income, uh, income side and compare it to, 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 to other banks, uh, it has the income side has been actually de facto fairly stable. Now, to make that happen, to make that happen, uh, that you, you have to uh, have enough fee income, and then also your economy needs to behave in such a way that you actually can uh, expand credit, and that is uh, de facto something that has been going on in this economy now uh, during, a, du during a number of years. So looking at these graphs, you can't really argue argue that the, uh, that the banking sector in some sense has stalled because, uh, because of the negative uh, policy rate or the low rates in, 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 in general. Well, that's another explanation. <laughs> could be, could be. Uh, I do think though, and I don't have the graphs here, is, is that one, one difference though is, is if, you were to if, you were, if you were to take a l close look at the cost base of Swedish banks and compare it to other European banks, uh, the cost base is much, much lower for, uh, for among Swedish banks compared to other European banks. So it, with various measures of that type, you can argue that the banking sector here is actually quite, uh, quite efficient. Now, um, as you also mentioned uh, when, when, when you uh, gave your remarks, is that on the other, the other side of the coin, so, so to speak, is overheating risk. And from your perspective, you you kind of said that uh, this uh, that you are not overly concerned in Japan about the overheating uh, risk, but in our case this is actually quite different because here, if you look at what is going on in the housing market and our housing market is dysfunctional for a number of different different reasons, house prices have been gone have been going up much much faster than the increase in, in disposable income and that's 
a classical attempt to defy gravity in one way or the other. And, and that's, of course, something that, uh, that worries us. And if you look at, uh, if you look at household debt to, to disposable income, uh, the graph on the right-hand side, then you, of course, as one would expect, uh, see, a, see, a, see a similar, uh, similar uh, picture. This is probably uh, also amplified by, by the low level of interest rates and maybe also, of course, amplified by, by the negative, uh, negative uh, policy rate. And as always in any economy, it's always difficult to do many different uh, things at the same time. So uh, to uh, get a better handle of this, this really rests on the assumption that we do or that we're willing or able to do enough on the macro prudential side in order to stop this. Uh, but so far that has not uh, that has not happened and that's of course a headache in its uh, in its own right and this is uh, this is where i get back to the issue that i started out saying that you talked about you you have a lot of public sector debt we have more private sector debt uh, to deal with in, in in one way or the other during this uh, uh, the, during this um, uh, episode and that of course also brings us into brings us to the debate that is uh, ongoing in this country and in many many other parts of the world and that is to what extent uh, what you call in 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 your speech uh, one should stick to what is called the separation principle or 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 there should be elements of leaning uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, dealing with these uh, issues another way of expressing this is to say that we would actually in this country need two different policy rates one for the corporates and another one for the households uh, but but it's hard to engineer that uh, with monetary with monetary policy only and if we were to uh, to uh, so very markedly raise our policy rate, that would probably lead to a substantial appreciation of the exchange rate, which in turn then would make it even more difficult to get uh, to get inflation inflation up. And that just reflects that it's hard to coordinate policies, uh, and that that holds here and in many many other places as as, as well. Finally, uh, let me show you a a a, a, a slide here describing who is responsible for financial stability in this country. And this is, of course, not even close to what the way you have it in Japan, but it kind of shows an issue which is the same, and that is that you have struggled through moving these bits and pieces around in Japan also for quite a while. As far as I know, now the whole thing has settled down, uh, but it was quite a process, and it took many, many years before things settled down in, 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 in your country where to, how to do this. Here we have the central bank dealing with liquidity we have the minister of finance producing the legal foundation for uh, for uh, financial sector regulation and we have the national debt office being the resolution authority and and we have our fsa being the macro prudential authority and this is a very very decentralized structure and just the other day uh, the political system decided on a a, a new amortization requirement uh, but what is remarkable is that uh, none of the authorities were actually involved in that in the sense that it was actually at the end of the day up to the politicians and parliament to deal with that issue. So, so in that respect, the whole macroprudential issue was kind of removed from those authorities dealing, expected to deal with these issues in, in one way or the other. And that, I think, is a good example of how hard it is to figure out how to do these things uh, when there are kind of technical considerations, when there are monetary policy considerations, when there are financial stability considerations, and when all of this, uh, at the end of the day, has to put, be put to in, in some kind of a political context for, for dealing with the issue, issue uh, in, in itself. And that's why it's just simply hard to do the, deal with these things. And you mentioned also towards the end of your speech that in addition to this, and, and this is only part of it, of course, part of this whole thing when we're talking about, let's say, the housing market, but that also holds for other markets, uh, part of this is also dealing with the tax system and other types of fiscal issues. Uh, so it's not just so easy to, to come up with systems uh, that are coherent and, uh, and systems that are built in such a way that we uh, avoid uh, problems in the future. But what really holds for both of us is that central banks are always the ultimate providers of liquidity and that held uh, in the, the Japanese banking crisis in the, in, in, in the 90s, and you have seen those uh, events and, and, and both night and, night and day. Uh, 
in, in, in Japan, and that was also the case here and in many, many other parts of the world uh, during the crisis of 08 and 09. Because when you run out of money, it's pretty clear where the money is, and that's why central banks and central bankers are always involved in this in one way uh, or another. Thank you. I told you. <laughs> uh, I would like to thank... Oh, please come up here. Please. You are the guest of honor. You should be in the middle. Uh, I'd like to thank bo both our speakers. They did something you haven't realized, but which, for which I am very grateful. You kept your allotted slot times, meaning we have now about half an hour for Q&A, uh, which I will leave, but there will be some time for you also to ask questions. Uh, my guess is that most people here are mainly interested what is in what's happening right now. But I, I would still like to start with asking a couple of questions pertaining to history uh, before we get into today. Um, and let, let's take the starting point. And, and um, I realize perhaps not everybody here understood all the finer points because not all people here are central bank governors. <laughs> So let me try to ask some simplifying questions. Um, you started um, discussing um, the different trajectories of Sweden and, and Japan, uh, Governor Nakaso, and, and Stefan Ingves did the same, really. Um, one thing was, which was very interesting to see that Sweden responded more rapidly and more aggressively in the 1990s than Japan did during its first years of crisis. A question which might be impossible for a central banker, maybe we should have an historian or sociologist or political scientist, but why is that so? Do you have any hypothesis why Sweden was more rapid and why Japan's answer was more delayed? Hypotheses are welcome. We, uh, we start. Um, um, this, these are my, my, my personal views, but a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, I think uh, there was a kind of general reluctance on the part of the authorities to, to ac acknowledge that a major crisis was approaching at the time um, be because of, let's say, overconfidence in the capacity to, to put problems under control or overconfidence in the, um, the, uh, the, the, the big banks uh, at the time. And, um, I think there was also a general euphoria, so to speak, held by the general public that good times would never end. So this was probably the first uh, uh, reason. And secondly, um, <clears throat> I think we, the authorities at the time, uh, presumed the, the problem in the, in the financial sectors were more or less confined to smaller institutions like uh, credit unions and credit cooperatives. And that is why we conducted a number of uh, studies uh, about the US SNL crisis or the, um, the uh, secondary banking crisis in the UK. But in fact, uh, the, bil the pressure was already building up in the, uh, the bigger uh, financial institutions. So in retrospect, I think we should have focused more on the Nordic banking crisis and the responses made by the, uh, the Nordic authorities uh, from the start. And thir thirdly, uh, I think um, um, uh, there was a kind of um, general lack of urgency mm. because although we had these banking problems, the, the failures were sort of sporadic mm. and confined, as I said, to smaller institutions. And it was not until the major, major crisis of the dark November in 1997, where four institutions, big ones including, uh, went under uh, successively in a single month. And that made the financial crisis um, as a national crisis visible to anyone's eyes. Only then, I think, um, um, we uh, embarked on the comprehensive uh, uh, response to deal with the banking crisis. So I think these are the three reasons why we are a bit delayed in responding to the major crisis. But um, as, as a result, we have learned lessons. And that is why I would like to say that our financial uh, s uh, safety net today is quite comprehensive. Uh, that can really deal, deal with um, almost any kind of uh, financial disruption 
not only in the banking sector, but other non-banking sector or the insurance uh, uh, sector, including. Um, these are quite comprehensive. And as they are based on our, our actual experience of dealing with the crisis, they have proven to be operational. So what we like to say is that we have learned lessons and the, 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 the framework of uh, financial safety net we have today is quite a comprehensive one. Uh, um. Thank you. Well, on, on, your, on your last point, let me really support you uh, when it comes to the Japanese safety net because you were actually quite early putting in changing your safety net to what you have today. And some of this is highly, highly technical and most people never get to the technical details of this. You know them by heart because you, you were part of it. Uh, but it was remarkable actually how, how you went about actually putting, to putting in place a very comprehensive safety net, which is not the case in many, many other countries because when the good times are back, usually you tend to forget about the whole thing. And, and don't uh, don't do that. Well, the other went back to that back to here. Then and and, and uh, one of some of the differences. Let me first say that I think it was around 1990 or something like that. Swedish banks were considered to be absolutely stellar comparing with other banks, and, and they got kind of gold stars because they were so profitable. But clearly, something was was brewing, so to speak, under the surface. And then we ended up with a combination of um, a fiscal crisis, a foreign exchange crisis, and a banking crisis all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that was in combination with a lot of uh, external debt. And in that environment, it became gradually clearer and clearer to those of us who were dealing with this and also to the politi uh, politicians who, who were dealing with this that basically the honor of the nation was at stake. Either we fix this problem or somebody else will tell us how to fix it. And that was very sobering because at the same time, the kingdom was a very, very large borrower in the global market. And it was just unthinkable to, to, to imagine that we would have a problem dealing with that. So there was a kind of a consensus that this is this is going overboard just fix it one way uh, one one way or the other and then that was what pushed this this process but that's also i think partly what happens in small open economies because in a small open economy you get the signal sooner uh, and 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 you have to react to that okay second history question which brings us to today's situation um your second slide, I think it was, uh, Governor Nakaso, was about the um, potential growth rate of Japan and how it has slowed because of demographics, because of slower productivity growth, etc., etc. Now, as both of you are well aware, this is something which is now hitting most Western economies as well. And we have this great debate going on, um, started, I, I would say, by a couple of years ago by Larry Summers about what he calls secular stagnation. And the policy conclusions from that could be quite different depending on to what extent you think it's the demand side or the supply side which is stagnating. But to what extent do you think that the Western countries today, that is to say the European countries and the US, can learn from the Japanese growth experience, uh, including policy responses? Governor Nakasa first. Yes. Um, as, as I explained my my uh, my uh, lecture today, I think there, there are probably three reasons um, for the decline in Japan's potential growth, uh, whether or not you call it a, a secular stagnation or not. First, the banking crisis uh, in the 90s, uh, by which the banking sector was uh, broken and the much needed uh, financial intermediation uh, uh, mediary function to support the economy was lost. So this was the first uh, reason. Secondly, uh, compounded with this was the demography mm. of uh, declining labor force, um, where, where you know working age population declines. And thirdly, of course, deflation. Uh, Perhaps, in retrospect, monetary easing was not that powerful enough at the early early stages, uh, <clears throat> and uh, to to prevent the deflationary mindset uh, from being embedded in the uh, the economy. So, these are the three regions. 
to some extent, these are the common elements that the, many of the developed economies are facing today. Um, but to take up the example of the Euro Europe, um, I think Europe is taking the, uh, the steps in the right direction because for these, th these three reasons I mentioned. Firstly, the banking sector. Um, I think um, the so-called single supervisory uh, mechanism has now become operational. And I understand the, the wider uh, financial safety net arrangement is now being installed. Um, <coughs> And of course, when it comes to uh, monetary policy, uh, ECB, the RICS Bank, they are fighting to prevent the deflationary pressure uh, from building up. Um, so and they are fighting a currency war. Not necessarily <laughs> so, I think, <laughs> when it comes to... Uh, right. Maybe the, the RICS Bank uh, is an open, small open economy, but uh, ECB, or we, explain that uh, uh, monetary policies are oriented exclusively to, to uh, price stability targets. So anyway, um, um, uh, uh, for these reasons, I, I don't think Europe faces an imminent uh, uh, risk of falling into a Japanese style of uh, the last two decades. Although I think there are relevant lessons to be learned. One advice I can give in this regard is that the time bought by the ECB or the RICS Bank uh, should be used in a very effective way uh, to promote uh, growth potential. <coughs> um, in this regard, um, um, in Japan, we have under the Abenomics the so-called three arrows strategy, uh, where monetary policy, fiscal policy, and growth strategies are combined to uh, generate uh, enough uh, force, impetus, or what may be called um, escape velocity to uh, get out of deflation and bring ba the economy back, back on track to sustain growth. Uh, this kind of um, policy coordination uh, or the uh, uh, coordination device may, may, may be necessary in order for the economy to uh, get back to a higher growth potential. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, First of all, when it comes to what is going on in Europe, uh, it has taken an incredibly long time to clean up the bank, the various banking sectors in Europe, and many have been quite unwilling to do so. And that process seems to be going on, still, is, is, is still going on in one way or the other in various countries. And uh, that reluctance is remarkable in the sense that how you actually do these things is not rocket science. All the information is available, all the knowledge is available, how you actually do it is, 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 is well understood uh, at the level of kind of experts. Uh, but on the other hand, sorting out the mess in the banking sector always uh, uh, generates a, a marked redistribution of ownership titles and wealth. And that is why it is always resisted. And that's why you always have somebody hoping that uh, things will improve tomorrow if you do nothing. And, and, and this is one of the issues. And there, uh, these issues have been gradually dealt with in Europe. And SSM is one, one example uh, of that. But it could have been done faster. We have been lucky in our corner of the world because uh, we avoided the Icelandic implosion. And then uh, we kept the Baltic countries alive. And that, meant, that means that what it, it is very, very unusual, f and, and the situation we are in is different, because in many other countries in Europe, they have been discussing for years how to put the pieces back together, uh, while when it comes to our housing market, we are still trying to avoid disaster. And in that sense, it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a challenge, because not many countries over the years have uh, succeeded in, 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 in doing that. When it comes to monetary policy in Europe and what is going on in, in, in Europe, uh, well, everybody would be very, very happy if the ECB can get the inflation rate up, because that's good for them, and that is definitely good for us. Uh, but at the same time, since we're not a member of the EMU, you have four small, very open economies that are dealing with the rough, an issue which is roughly not identical, but of a similar type, uh, because you have the Swiss, you have the Czechs, you have the Danes, and you have us. Uh, 
and it would be just impossible to sit with our arms crossed uh, doing uh, doing nothing. And at but the, the end, Danes, I mean, they have a fixed exchange rate. They have a fixed exchange rate, but they, they are ha- but a wart on the body of Germany. Yeah, but at the end of the day, the end result is very, very expansionary monetary policy everywhere. And and uh, if that's the end result, it shouldn't uh, shouldn't be a bad thing over over time because that means that inflation will go up eventually everywhere. Okay, that concludes the history lessons, and as you hear, we are already now in the present. And uh, the floor is open for those who want to ask questions. However, they have to be short, crisp, intelligent, and fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> only the moderator is allowed to ramble incoherently. Uh, and I will start to ramble with the first question, and you think about your own questions. Um, we are now discussing ZIRP and NIRP, um, or however you want to pr- uh, pronounce it. And um, ZIRP obviously has the zero boundary. What y- and y- you carefully both avoided where a bottom might be of NIRP, because nobody knows, of course. That depends on what happens with uh, cash or notes and coins and all that stuff. But And I realize you cannot say anything in your capacities as governors, but as theoretical economists in this small group you of academic friends, you can hypothetically reason of whether there is some kind of floor for NIRP, i.e. negative interest rates. How far can you go? Two factors um, that are considered to be impediments to to go farther into the negative territory. One, as I mentioned, uh, the the earnings, banks' earnings, Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, 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 um, um, pressure on bank er earnings uh, coming from the negative rates would um, uh, erode the intermediary function that is counterproductive. So that is the first sec- uh, factor. And secondly, um, how to prevent I mean, the leakage from reserves to banknotes mm. <coughs> um, to avoid negative rates. One might uh, uh, run, uh, 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 withdraw uh, reserves into, into cash banknotes, but uh, that requires transportation costs and uh, 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 storage costs. Um, in 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 two two these two uh, factors, uh, the BOJ has uh, done a few things. First of all, with regard to the impact on uh, on bank earnings, uh, we have introduced a so-called three-tier system, which is tiering uh, the excess reserves into three tiers. Uh, by which I mean. It's only the marginal portion, the marginal tier, which represents accounts only for less than 4% of the entire reserve to which negative 10 basis is applied. For other two tiers, either 10 basis positive rates or zero rates are applied. This makes marginal rates negative, but the average rate paid on the reserves remain positive. Um, But this was... Um, powerful enough to, as I explained in my lecture, it was powerful enough to bring down the yield curve because it was the marginal rate that really matters for a a financial transaction in the market. Meanwhile, uh, direct impact uh, of uh, negative rates on on banks' earnings is mitigated by this uh, uh, maintaining uh, positive uh, average uh, interest rate paid on on, on on excess reserves. So this is with regard to the first sec- uh, 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 factor. The second one, uh, with regard to the, the banknotes, I mean, leakage from reserves to cash. We have uh, uh, introduced a system where, uh, in, in case where a bank withdraws reserves into cash in an excessive way, we can place negative rates on this incremental uh, um, cash uh, withdrawn by a financial institution um, to prevent this leakage to happen in a larger scale. So with two of these uh, uh, measures put in place, it is, I think, technically technically possible to go farther into the negative territory. Um, I don't know to what extent, but it's technically still uh, possible to further go into the negative territory. But for the time being, because this is entirely a new policy, 
we would like to uh, monitor how uh, these negative interest rate policy, which has already sort of materialized in lower lending cost and um, uh, lower uh, uh, yield curves, are uh, going in translated into to how how this is going to work through the economy. This is something we would like to watch for for some for, for some time. Thanks. A few kind of technical remarks ar around this. First, when it comes to bank earnings, uh, presently, given the size of the liquidity surplus, what, what the banks are depositing wi with the central bank, the cost of those deposits annually is roughly a billion. Uh, last year, the banking sector as a whole made 90 billion or something like that. So you cannot argue that, that the banks cannot or should, couldn't be able to, uh, to, to handle that in terms of direct cost of these uh, these deposits and as I uh, as, as you saw when I showed the graphs uh, return on equity is fairly fairly high having said that though of course in the end another issue that matters is to what extent negative a negative policy rate uh, compresses uh, rates generally speaking and then it, there will be differences and always will be differences for, uh, from one bank to another because if a bank is funding itself by deposits only uh, then they probably will end up with a lower uh, interest rate margin compared to a bank which is uh, managing part of its funding in the global market, let's say. So it depends on the distribution. Uh, on the side, when it comes to the whole issue of cash, well, I, the other last week I argued about uh, these things can completely in the other di in the other direction because in this country, the outstanding uh, uh, nominal amount of cash five years ago or something like that was roughly 110 billion. Today, it's roughly around 70 and still going down. So we see no hoarding of cash when it comes to this. It's, it's actually, given that we're changing all the notes and coins, it actually goes in the other direction uh, because people are digging up what they have, what, what old notes they have in their mattresses and, and, and bring them to, uh, to the banks. Uh, so based on this, I'd say that technically speaking, yes, it's it's uh, fully possible to go go lower, uh, but how low? That's uh, that's an open okay. uh, open issue. But that's in a sense only half the question because you're both saying, hypothetically, theoretically, we can go lower. Mm -hmm. Next part of the question is, for how long can a central bank stay low? I mean, you you are well aware of the debate carried on, for instance, in your old organization, the Bank for International Settlements, that there's a risk of having too low rates too long. That fosters sort of speculative behavior in financial market. And, and if so, perhaps the Schumpeterian sort of animal spirits or creative destruction that you talked about in the financial sector might malfunction in a sense. So there are dangers with staying low for long. How do you see that? I think uh, you're right. I mean, um, the very reason that we introduced this negative interest rate policy uh, with QQE um, is to accelerate the process um, uh, out of deflation mm. and eventually bring the, the, the rates to a more or less normal uh, uh, shape. So the very intention is to accelerate. And I think you're right. Uh, the longer uh, uh, the, the, the unconventional policies like this uh, the bigger the possibility of, of, of side effects. No, I mean, if you are successful uh, going through this episode, then we, we will get inflation up, uh, up at around 2% and eventually things will normalize and everybody is better off if, that, if it doesn't take forever to, to get to that point bec because clearly, particularly when you start talking about negative rates and, 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 how, uh, and when the general public reflects on, on, on negative rates, it's quite difficult because it's moving to a different state of the world, and uh, we don't know what that might do over time if this were to last for a very, very long time. That leads me to a third aspect of that question. We have sort of floor rates, we have the question of for how long, but of course, if they don't work as intended, there will probably be some kind of political or other pressure to use even stronger instruments. And of course, talking of course of helicopter money, which is formally prohibited, at least in Europe. Do you, a couple of years ago, none of us would have forecasted, or very few of us, negative rates, but now we're there. How do you see sort of the discussion of helicopter money uh, in a theoretical, hypothetical <laughs> sense, of course? <laughs> and then I see, Mar, is this, on, is this on this issue, or do you, can you wait for three minutes? Three minutes, and then you see. 
Well, you know, uh, answering from a slightly different angle. Um, um, as I mentioned in my lecture, the, the basic problem for Japan is the lower growth potential. Yeah. Um, it's completely our mission to get out of deflation, but that would not be uh, 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 that will be necessary, but not sufficient to uh, to to bring the Japanese economy back on track towards sustained growth. We need to raise growth potential. Um, this is this is absolutely essential to avoid the kind of situation you mentioned. That is why um, um, we argue very much in favor of the original third arrow of growth strategy. Uh, of course, we can contribute uh, from the monetary policy side, which is a de demand stimulus policy, uh, but um, uh, uh, it, you can, you can uh, uh, stimulate investment uh, or uh, uh, labor inputs. Uh, in this way, I think you can still contribute to the uh, 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 expansion of the, um, the uh, uh, growth potential, but uh, equally important is the policy from the supply side. And this is something that uh, uh, we would like to very much argue in favor of. Well, strong, I mean, the, the underlying issue here is to get inflation up in an orderly way. Because how to create inflation and how to create a lot of inflation in a disorderly way, that is well known. And, and uh, that has been tried in many, many parts of the, of, of, of the world uh, and over history. And that's not what we would like to, to, to achieve. So on the one hand, there are all sorts of instruments that one can think of. On the other hand, uh, let's hope that we don't, we don't have to use them so that we actually end up uh, getting out of this uh, fairly, uh, fairly soon. Uh, but having said that, uh, let me support all the reflections here on, on, on stru structural policies because monetary policy cannot fix every imaginable problem in the world. In the end, when it comes to structural change, that has to be managed and handled by others, and that's really about how the economy functions, uh, broadly, broadly speaking. Weren't the central bankers the masters of the universe years ago? Couldn't um, you fix everything? I've never <laughs> felt it that way. <laughs> can, I, can I just put one, one thing uh, in, 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 in relation to what I have said? Uh, I, 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 I explained, reiterated the importance of uh, growth strategy, but that would be a little bit more specific. Uh, we are an economy where, where the labor force is declining. So the only way up to, to raise growth potential uh, is to raise productivity. Or immigration. Well, immigration is, is one thing, but uh, uh, let's assume that this is, this is not uh, something that can, that can be done immediately. If that's the case, the only way up, as I said, is uh, raise productivity. And this is absolutely important. And I think when it comes to producti productivity uh, 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 increase, I think there is some room, particularly in, in our case, in the, the growing services sector. In the manufacturing sector, I think the productivity is quite high already, but uh, I think there is still room in the services industry to raise uh, productivity, and that would contribute to raising the growth potential. Okay. Last question tonight goes to Maria Radetzky, Professor of Economics. You have a microphone, I think, in your seat. The side of your seat. We take the Nobel Prize back. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> no, I'd say probably not. Because eventually if you create enough money, prices will go up. And that's, that, that's for sure. Because there are also other, other parts of the world and other countries where, where they do have a problem with inflation. So it's not that uh, these fundamentals have, have changed. It might take a while. It has already taken a while. Uh, because uh, many, many... Uh, things uh, when it have been going on at the global level in the past past decade decade or so uh, 
you know, but eventually inflation will come back. It just takes a long time to put the pieces back together after a financial crisis. A more technical way of answering the question would say that the transmission mechanism has weakened. Sure. But for what reasons? Well, one reason is, 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 is the financial sector as such in different parts of the world because it takes a long time to put the pieces back together and if the banks are not lending, it doesn't really matter how much money you put into the system. Or another way of, of expressing the same thing uh, would be to say that, uh, that, that if uh, velocity of money goes down using these, this old terminology, then you have to compensate for that by putting more and more money into the system in order to make sure that you engineer a bit of inflation. Can we have chart three from uh, Governor Nakaso's presentation, please, if possible? You can go ahead anyway. Yeah. Um, hopefully this is coming back. Um, in terms of monetary stimulus, uh, it's stronger than ever. Uh, um, as, as probably um, you can see probably later on, on chart three that I, I provided. Um, Real interest rates are well below the natural rate of interest. Uh, chart are. three. Yep, it's coming. Yeah. There yeah. We are. This 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 is the uh, oops. This is the real interest rate, and this is the estimated uh, natural rate of interest. So this gap is larger than ever, which means the uh, stimulus coming from monetary policy is stronger than ever. And yet, as you say, inf uh, inflation is not coming back. Why? Uh, um, I, I think there are a couple of reasons. But um, one thing that is probably quite uh, 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 evident uh, for Japanese cases is that we've been under deflation for such a long time, almost a decade, and uh, which the so-called inflation expectations has become so low, around 0%. And it's embedded in the society in a way. Uh, what may be called deflationary mindset is deeply embedded, and it's a very die-hard kind of um, sentiment. It's uh, according to our um, our estimate, it's in transition from zero percent. I mean, the inflation expectation, uh, 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 estimated inflation expectation, is just in transition from zero uh, to around one percent. So it's still halfway through, but. Um, Probably this, you know, very die-hard kind of deflationary mindset is still uh, one reason that is uh, dragging the in inflation, despite this powerful stimulus from the monetary policy. With that, I think we need to end the session. I think it's one thing which is striking is that though, even though our nations are very different in size, in population, in geography, uh, and a number of things, not least history. And, and the setup of monetary policy, uh, the issues are quite similar. I mean, you can discuss, despite the fact that you are in different parts of the globe, with different countries, different history, which shows how difficult these issues are when two brilliant governors of central banks that different fight the same issues and have to tackle the same issues day by day. I think this is a lesson for all of us. This is really difficult. And on that happy ending, I give the word to Mia. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Governor, for coming here and also to give us this insight about all the work that you are doing for the Japanese economy and also in, 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 in contributing to the world economy as we feel here in Sweden. And also I think your collaboration also, as Klaus mentioned, uh, uh, give us some... It, it, it relief with such uh, strong men in such strong positions. And on behalf of Eva and our co-organizers, this is a small token. Oh, thank and you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. And Governor Ingves, we're also very grateful for having taken time to be with us here tonight and to Klaus, who led us through this discussion. Thank you all.